manage your information well, you can do things better than other businesses can. You can cut your costs, you can, you can optimize your productivity, you can have a lot of great things happen to you. The key in that is getting information. Now a lot of organizations can have tons of data, but we talked about distinguishing data from information. Data is just a raw collection, a glob, a pile of data. All right, pile of numbers, facts, figures, stuff, all right, with no sense of organization or anything like that. If a business has a lot of data, all right, that's a, that's a step in the right direction, but it won't be meaningful unless they somehow organize it and put it together and use it to come to some conclusions that they can use to make their decision. Now, going back to the first class, we said that the data an organization stores doesn't change a lot over time. In other words, organizations have orders today just like they had 50 years ago. Organizations have customers today like they had 50 years ago. What's going to be different, what's going to change over time is how they want to pull that information out. And that's not always obvious and that's not always predictable. As such, the more flexible you can be as far as how to pull that data out, the better shape that you're going to be in. All right? That was what the limitations of the file systems that we talked about last time were. They were built for one purpose and one purpose only. You had a payroll file that did payroll stuff. You had a commission file that did commission stuff. Now, you could combine stuff sort of. But there was a couple of issues. For one, it was, you, know, you kind of had to, uh, it kind of could be a struggle to combine stuff from separate files together uh, to get information. The other issue is the fact that you had redundant data. All right? And by redundant data, I mean you have the same data stored in multiple locations. That in itself isn't necessarily a problem, except for the fact when you have that situation, you run the risk of having inconsistencies. That, in other words, if you look in one place, it might say that a sales rep sold $100,000 last month uh, worth of merchandise. If you look in a different place, it might show you that they sold $110,000. Which one's right? All right? If you only record that, that data in one place, it could be right, it could be wrong, but it's not going to be inconsistent. If it's wrong, you correct it, and you'll correct it everywhere. With files, you had all this data spread about and it was redundant data, which means that it could get out of sync and could be inconsistent. The other issue that you ran into was what is called anomalies. All right. Um, what is an anomaly? It's, it's an unusual, odd, bad, problematic condition. For example, if the customer file is separate from the order file, and they're these separate entities, you can write a program to try to keep them matched up, but it's always possible that if there's a bug in the program or whatever, you could end up having a order without a customer. And that really doesn't make sense, right? You know, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to you know, get an order without a customer, right? That doesn't make sense. Or you could have a paycheck for someone that's not an employee, that's not in the employee table, or any sort of these kind of oddball things. These are called anomalies, and they're bad. So, to summarize, prior to databases, the way the data was stored was, were not very flexible, had redundant data, and that led to inconsistencies, and last but not least, had these anomalies where you had unusual circumstances. All these things taken together meant that the information you got out of them was potentially less reliable than it ought to be. All right? Databases now. All right? Databases attempt to solve a lot of those issues because everything is stored in one spot. One of the best definitions I've heard of a database is that everything in a database should only be in there once. So if the fact that I'm an employee here at Loring Community College, my employee information should exist only in one place. All right? Which means that if I move, I tell them, they update that one place, and then there's no risk of there being any sort of inconsistencies. Any application that uses data about employees should be looking at the same place, and that is within a database. Um, 
a database then really is data about not one individual thing like the files were, but data about multiple different entities. So with files, you might have a customer file and a payroll file and an order file and a commission file. With databases, everything resides in the one database. The textbook calls these things themes. I'm not sure I like that word. They say, you know, create a file that has only one, or create a table that only has one theme. I'm not sure if I like that word. Uh, a word that, that I've heard often used is entity, all right? Um, thing, subject, I mean, fill in your favorite word. But each table within a database is about one thing but all the tables are collected together in a single database. All right. Um, the database then is only really accessed by one program, the database management system. All right. Back in the bad old days, there used to be a bunch of programs that would access these files. So each one of those programs would have to know the rules of the business. That is, you can't have an order without a customer. Commission checks have to exist for employees, so on and so forth. All right? Which meant that, you know, as they say, a chain's only as strong as its weakest link. So if all these programs worked right, but this one had an error in it, it's liable to allow us to delete a customer that has orders. If it wasn't smart enough to check and make sure that there were no orders for the customer that you're trying to delete. In which case, then you'd run with up with an anomaly because there'd be something here that didn't match something there and the very problem that we have with files. With databases, all the knowledge about the data and the way the data is supposed to be and the way, to, the, way the data is related to each other is actually stored in the database. So in addition to all this information about the different entities, and the textbook calls them themes again, also, the relationships between the entities are stored. And we'll look uh, at an example, and we'll look what I mean by that um, in a little bit here. Only one program accesses the database, and that's the database management system. What's the implication of that? The implication of that is that no matter how I try to access the data, all the different programs that might exist, the payroll program and the personnel program and the website that shows the products, everything that wants to pull data from the database goes through the DBMS. Now the DBMS is a piece of software. It's, it's typically a, a expensive, elaborate piece of software. And you can think of it like a, re, uh, a reference librarian in a library. You know, there's certain books that they have tucked away that, you know, regular folks aren't allowed to go into and get, all right? You have to ask the resource, uh, reference librarian, rather, and the reference librarian will go and get them and bring them to you, all right? The advantage of that is only that librarian needs to know where everything is stored, right? And they can control access to that, all right? Same idea here. Any request for data goes through the DBMS, which means that only the DBMS is responsible for enforcing the rules and relationships of the data. So everything goes through the DBMS as far as database access to go. All right? So we've got rid of redundancy, right? Because everything's in one place. We're going to only store things in one place. All right? The thing is, however, is we're still going to have to store the relationship between data. And that's what I spent, want to spend a few minutes talking about 
how that's actually done. In order to do that, we're going to explore some definitions. All right. Database, collection of data about multiple entities and the relationships between them. I just made that up. It's not like an official definition or anything. All right, I just made that up right now. All right, but it is true. The key words here is a database isn't one kind of data. A database contains multiple kinds of data. And in addition to that, it contains how the data is related to each other. Oh, a paycheck has to be associated with an employee. That's what I mean by how the data is related to each other. An order has to have a customer associated with it. An order has to have a sales rep associated with it. An order can have one or multiple items that, are, that are, have been ordered on the order. All those things are examples of relationships. Each one of those things individually, orders, items, sales reps, customers are their own entities. But they get related to each other in different ways in the database. In both the data about those entities and the data about the relationships between those entities get stored in the database. And what's great is, once those relationships are stored, the database makes sure that no one breaks those rules. All right? Back with file systems, we had multiple points of access for all this data. Different programs could access that data. So no one program had complete control over the data, which means any of them could mess it up. Databases, we don't have that issue because all the access to the data goes through the DBMS and the DBMS makes sure that the rules of the database are enforced. So that's our first definition. A table is collection of data about one entity. All right. So, I may speak of the customer table. That would be all the information about a customer. The customer's customer number, the customer's uh, name, the customer's address, phone number, email address, etc. All the information, all the pieces of data that we want to store about a customer would be in the customer table. All right. Each table is about one entity. All right. So there'd be a customer table, and there would be an order table, and there would be an employee table, and there would be a paycheck table, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Only place that information, oh, I'm sorry, the only place that data about a customer will be stored will be in the customer table. All right? We'll talk about how it'll be set up if you need to relate the customer table to another table. All right, we'll talk about that in a second. Primary key is, well, let's skip that one for now. Let's talk about a column. A column is one piece of data. A row are, uh, is all the columns about one member of the entity. So for example, if we're looking at the customer table, a column might be the customer name. It's one piece of data about that entity. A column might be the address, phone number, email address, etc. All those are just one piece of data about members of that entity. If I take everything, about, you know, Jones Incorporated. All those columns, the customer number, the, the uh, name, city, state, zip, address, phone number, email, all that together is said to be a row in the database. So every one of you have a row in the student database. 
and there are multiple columns stored about you. You know, there'd be a column for your student number, there'd be a column for your first name, there'd be a column for your last name, column for middle initial, address, city, state, zip, and maybe some other pieces of information as well. All right. So that's what a column is. That's what a row is. You know, multiple columns make up a row. Multiple rows make up a table. All right. So a table is a collection of rows. A row is a collection of columns. And a column is just one elemental piece of data. You can't break it down any further, a column. All right. There's a special column or columns in each table. And that's called the primary key. It's the column or columns that uniquely identify a row. When I say the word uniquely, I mean that there is only one. All right? For example, name would not uniquely identify you. There could be someone that has the same name as you. All right? Um, phone number might not uniquely identify you. There might be two people in your household that attend classes here, for example, if we're talking about the student table. All right? Student number uniquely identifies you. You're the only, whatever your student number is, you're the only person that has that student number. All right? The characteristic of a primary key is that every member of that entity has one, so every student has a student number, and no two members of that entity have the same value for it. So, student number is an example of a primary key. So if we went over and looked at the database that they have here at LC, the primary key of the student table would be the student number. All right, because everyone has one. All right. And everyone has a different one. You know, if I were to shout out a student number, 127956, all right, two of you wouldn't raise your hand and say, that's my student number, only one. Could you imagine if two of you did have that? There'd be great confusion about who owed the bill, who got credit for the grade, who got the degree, and so on and so forth. That wouldn't be a good situation. You want to be able to say, hey, this piece of information belongs to that person and only that person. And every table in a relational database is going to have some primary key. And it can be one column. For example, it could be, as I mentioned, student ID, employee ID, customer number, things like that. Or it could be a combination of multiple fields. An example of that is, let's say we had a table of all the rooms that were here on campus. All right? Um, this is BU 105, right? We couldn't have BU, we couldn't have the building code be the primary key, right? Because there's a bunch of buildings in the business division. All right, there's BU 105, across the hall is BU 106, upstairs is BU 205, 206, 104, 102. So BU by itself doesn't uniquely identify this room on campus. If I say go to room BU, you don't know which room I mean. By the same token, 105 wouldn't uniquely identify it either, right? Because there's a 105 in this building, across over in the physical science building, there's probably another 105. If you went over to the engineering building, there's probably another 105. So if I said go to room 105, that also would not uniquely identify, all right, the, uh, the building, or I'm sorry, the room, all right? However, if I use the combination of those two fields and said, go to BU 105, that uniquely identifies this room. There's no other room on campus that's BU 105. This is the only one. All right? So if we had a table for the rooms here on campus, uh, the primary key would likely be the building code and the room number. So for any table, you know, we'll talk about later on some of the criteria for what makes for a good key, because sometimes you have choices, all right? Um, but the thing to remember is it uniquely identifies. It identifies exactly one row, and no one has duplicates, and everyone has a value for it, all right? Um, it wouldn't make sense for there to be a room with no label on, all right? You know, the secret room, 
You know, you have class in the secret room. No, everyone's going to have a code, just like everyone's going to have a student number. So that's a primary key. Now, let's talk about a little bit about relationships between tables. All right? And we'll talk about them first, then we'll, we'll bring the terminology in that we're going to go with. All right? We know, for example, that there's a relationship between orders and customers. Okay, thank you. We know, for example, that there's a relationship between orders and customers. All right? You can't have an order without a customer. It doesn't make any sense to have an order without a customer. You know, we got to know who to send the bill to. You know, we got to know who we're getting the money from. Got to know where to ship the goods. So in the order table, we might have things such as the order number. In fact, the order number probably would be a good candidate to be the primary key to that table. And we might have the date that it was ordered. And we might have other pieces of information about the order. All right. In the customer table, we would have things like I described, probably the customer number, which would probably be a good primary key. Maybe the customer name, address, city, state, zip, phone, email, etc. Somehow, we have to say, for example, if Jones Incorporated is customer number one, and they placed order number 150 today, Somehow we have to say, and somehow we have to store the fact that this order belongs to this customer. How do you suspect we're going to do that? How can we show that that order belongs to that particular customer? What can we store where to, to keep track of that? Any thoughts? Okay, the receipts might be the physical thing that goes along with that, but as far as the table goes, what would we put where to keep track of the fact that this order belongs to this customer? Put the customer number as an attribute or as a column in the order table. And in this case, it would match up. And if Jones Inc. placed this order, Whatever Jones Inc.'s customer number is, we would store as a column in the order table. And if Davis Inc. was customer number three and they had an order, then we'd store the three in the customer number. This is what we mean about defining the relationships in a database. Now you might say, doesn't this, doesn't this, isn't this uh, breaking what I said a second ago that everything about a customer is stored in one place. Not really. All the customer information is in the customer table. This order simply refers to the customer that has it. In other words, we're not going to store the customer name over here and the address. We are simply going to point to the fact that one of the pieces of information about an order is a customer that placed that order. Right? It truly is an attribute or a column associated with the order. Sometimes I'll use the word attribute, and when I do, it means the same thing as column. It's a, it's a value associated with an entity. So all the data about the customer is still in the customer table. However, other tables may use that table's primary key to point to it, to say that this customer has this order. By the same token, there might be a sales rep table that has the sales rep number 
and the first name and the last name and maybe other information. So maybe sales rep 2 is Bill Smith. How are we going to associate that Bill Smith is the one that took this order? Well, we're going to have a field called the sales rep number. And for this order, it will have a value of 2 to link that. So we use these keys to link together tables. All right. Every table is going to have a primary key, and that primary key is used to link other tables back to itself. This is called a foreign key. And if we're going to define the term foreign key, it would be when one table uses another's primary key to point to it. Now, here's the great thing about foreign keys. With foreign keys, we can establish what's called referential integrity. Now, that's kind of a, you know, intimidating phrase. It's actually real simple. The database makes sure that these keys match up. Let's say, for example, we had 10 customers in our database, customer 1 through customer 10. Those are the only 10 customers we have, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The database would not allow us to put in an order for customer 12. All right. Why? Because there is no such thing as customer 12. All right. That's, it's nonsense to say, hey, here's an order for customer 12 when the only customers in the table, in the customer table, are 1 through 10. The database will flat out keeping you from, from doing that. All right? And that's a good thing, right? Because then we're not going to have any of what we described before as anomalies, where you have orders that point to non existent customers or paychecks for non existent employees. Everything is going to match up properly. What's more, referential integrity can be set up so that if customer one has an order, you can't delete customer one, right? Because if you deleted customer one, then it would leave this order out there hanging, pointing to a non-existent customer again. That's called referential integrity. And again, that's a good thing. All right? So this is how really this database is different than those individual files where everything's kind of standalone and each program kind of has to match stuff up. The database matches it up. How does it match up? through these keys. Each table has a primary key, and that key uniquely identifies a row. It points to one row, all right? And other tables use that key to point where there's a relationship, where something in this table matches up with something in that table. For example, when a professor matches up with a class, or when a student matches up with a major, or when a customer matches up with an order, all right? Any questions about this? Let's go in and actually create this in Access and see this in action, because we're talking about this, you know, theoretically, you know, and that's important. One thing I would like to emphasize about this class is this class isn't per se an Access class. We use Access, but really the biggest knowledge that we'll gain from this class are things such as how to design a database property properly. And that kind of transfers across uh, multiple, you know, all different sorts of databases. All right. Um, however, at the end of the day, we have to we have to actually implement our databases. We're not simply going to talk about them the whole, uh, you know, the whole term. So therefore, we have to find some database to use. And for this class, we've chosen Access. All right. So let's go in and let's create a simple 
uh, customer and order table with a few attributes. And then we'll take a look at setting up the referential integrity and we'll see an example of what that means. All right, so let me start access. I'm going to create a new blank database. Pretty much everything we do in this class will be with a new blank database. Um, they do give you kind of some templates, which are like a head start. And you know that may be useful for novices and, and people that don't really understand database design. But really, the point of this class is so that you do understand it. So we will be creating all our databases using a blank database. We get to pick where we're going to put it. So I will put that on the desktop and we'll call it Tuesday database. By this time my imagination is, is totally gone. And I click create and we get a blank screen. Alright, uh, we get almost a blank screen. It knows that you're, you're gonna have to have some sort of table. Alright, So it kind of creates for you a blank table. All right. My suggestion is not to use this method of entering data into Access. This method is, is I think, useful for people that maybe are used to using Excel, because this pretty much looks like an Excel worksheet. All right. So I wouldn't suggest that you create your tables this way. What I would suggest doing is right mousing on this and going into Design View. All right. When you do that, it will ask you what do you want to call your table. Well, our first table we want to call customer. So we type in customer, click OK. And then we get this screen where we set up our columns all right, that are going to be in our database. We set up the attributes for this entity, the columns for this table. Now, right off the bat, it gives you one column that it calls ID and it designates it as being the primary key. That's what that little right here symbol is. That's a key, all right? Because it knows that every table should have a key, all right? I'm going to go and I'm going to change the name to customer ID, all right? Auto number is the type of data that is. And auto number simply means that it will start numbering this with one. So it will make the first row one, the second row two, the third row three, and so on. And you don't have to do anything to, to do that. Later on in the course, we'll, we'll talk about when is this kind of key a good idea, when is it not a good idea. But for the most part, it's a pretty good idea because that guarantees that it's going to be unique and you really don't have to worry about fussing with it the database will generate the, the next number for you. So for order numbers, it will generate the next order number for you. So you can put in some comments here, all right, if you wanted to. You can then go in and add as many fields as you want, all right. So I can put in the customer name. The data type, I can make it text. Text means it will accept alphabetic characters or punctuation symbols or numbers or anything that you can type in on the keyboard. I can define how big I want to make it. Like so, I might know, for example, that, that my biggest customer name will probably be maybe something like 50 characters. I can specify some other things. For example, I can specify if it's required or not. All right. It kind of makes sense that if you have a customer, they better have a name, right? So I'm going to make that required. And there's some other properties that you can set, all right? The, this, this property down here relates to whatever field you're entering at the time. So if I go down and put in, for example, email address, now the property down here relates to email address. And maybe the longest email address is 60 characters, 
as a guess. I would hate to have one that long, but you never know. I'm going to say that it's not required because, you know, there could be some customers you deal with that simply don't have an email address, so we'll, we'll say it's not required. All right. Um, oops. Address, text 255, required, yes. City, text, AB50. Required, yes. State, um, text, we'll go with the two character codes. Required, yes. And then finally, zip. Zop, yeah, new thing. And we'll only store the five digit code, so we'll say that it's a number and that it is. Um, an integer. All right. With numbers, you can store different sorts of numbers: integers, long integers, decimals, and all that. We'll, we'll, you know, there there may be occasion for us to talk about that in more detail, but you can show that. All right. So here's our customer table. All right. We can go out of here and save it, and we've saved our customer table. We can now go and enter data in here. How do you enter data into it? You can double click on it. And what that will do is that will show you all the fields that you've defined, all the columns that you've defined in this database and allows you to enter values into it. Notice the customer ID you don't enter anything into it's because we've defined it as being auto number. It will automatically generate that one. But I can go in for the first one customer name, Jones Incorporated. Notice how it generated a customer number of one for that first customer. Email address. Eh, I don't feel like filling out the rest of them. Oh! Huh. I have to put a value in the address field. Why is that? Because I've made that a required field. So I can't save this row without filling out all the things I said are required. I can exit it without putting an email address in because I didn't say the email address was required. But the rest of the things I have to put some value in. Probably should have made that a long integer, not just an integer. Did make it a long integer. Oh, thank you. There we go. So now I can go in and make that. All right, there we go. And now we can enter in the next customer and the next customer and the next customer. Now you notice that it didn't let me go in and enter a customer without putting in the required things. As Martha Stewart would say, that's a good thing, right? We can't, through hook or by crook, shoehorn in any bad data into this table. It doesn't matter what program we use to try to get it in. You can write a website that uses access databases. Through your web page, you can't get bad data in. Through this method of entry, you can't get bad data in. Through writing a Visual Basic program, you can't get bad data in. Because we're using a database and because we've defined the rules for that data in the database, all right, along with what columns we're going to store, you can't put in bad data. The database simply won't allow it. So we won't have anything goofy like a customer that doesn't have a name or a customer that doesn't have an address. This is going to increase the validity of our data and therefore our information by a gigantic factor. All right. Think of back in this scenario when you had all these different programs that could access all these different files. This one might allow you to put in a customer that didn't have an address. You know, maybe these two programs got it right, but maybe this one got it wrong. All right? 
Bottom line is, in this case, since multiple programs are accessing the data, it's only as good as the worst program that's accessing that data and changing it, which means if one of them has a bug, the data is bad for all of them. Contrast that with the database approach, whereas everything, all access is done through the database management system, which means that this is the gatekeeper. None of these programs can do anything bad because the database management system is going to enforce the rules to make sure that the data is correct. All right. Let's close out of the customer table now and let's go and enter an order table. So I'll close out of that. Let me enter a second customer just so that we can, we can do that. Davis Company... Notice that we have customer ID 1 and customer ID 2. Close out of here. Let's go and create a second table. Create table. Again, it will give this this kind of hokey spreadsheet looking thing. We don't want to use that. We will right mouse and go into design view. Table name that we want to store, order. All right. I can put in an order number. I can put in the order date and I can make that date field. I can put in maybe shipping instructions. You know, anything that I would want to put in associated with an order. Finally though, I want to put what customer has made this order. All right. So how do I do that? Well, remember, I do that by creating a foreign key. What's a foreign key? It's a field that's going to point back to the customer table. So I'll create a column that's called customer ID. Same name as in the other table. And I will say that it's a number and specifically it's a long integer. All right. And then I can go in and save it. We haven't completely created the foreign key yet. We've done half the job. Let's go and let's finish the job now. All right? Boy, that sounds ominous, you know? Let's go finish the job. Watch too many gangster movies, I guess. The way we finish the job is we go into Database Tools and click on Relationships. This is where you truly finish defining the foreign key. This is where you define all the relationships that exist in your database. So I click on that. It will show me all my tables. I can pick them and click Add. And it will show me those tables like this. What I do is I simply drag the field in this table that points to the primary key in this table and drop it. So I will drag Customer ID over to customer ID over here and drop it. When I do that, I get this little dialog box. And it says, you know, that I'm linking the customer's customer ID with the order number's customer ID. All right, that's what I want to do. Remember, going back to this situation. I want the customer number here to point to the customer number there. I'm not going to store anything else about the customer in the order file, or the order table rather, but I do need to know what customer placed this order. I do, need, I do need to establish that relationship and point that this order belongs to this customer. So, I do that, and I'm going to click Enforce Referential Integrity. When you're creating a new database, going to click Enforce Referential Integrity. When you're creating a brand new database, you pretty much always want to do that. Um, 
only the rarest of exceptions. I can only think of one good reason why you would not want to do that, and maybe towards the end of the class we'll, we'll go over that. For any of the databases you create, you will always uh, uh, click enforce referential integrity. That's what truly makes this a foreign key now. All right. I click create. It draws a line between the two. All right. That shows you that this is a specific kind of relationship, a one to many relationship. We'll go over the nature of relationships and you know the kinds of relationships there are in more detail next time, but probably the most common relationship is a one to many relationship where one customer can have many orders associated with them, right? You know, Jones Inc., if they call today and place an order, if they call tomorrow and place an order, we're not going to say, yep, sorry, bud, you ordered yesterday, right? We're going to give them that order, and we'll give them an order the next day, too. So one customer can have multiple orders, but any given order is only associated with one customer. So that's what a one-to-many relationship means, and that's what these symbols mean. One of these can have many of these. Each of these can only have one of these. Now, let's look at what that means. I go into the order table, and I type in the order date as being today. Shipping instructions, you know, take to back door. Customer ID, if I put in one, I'm okay, right? Because I do have a customer one. Next order, though, let's say I try to add it with customer number four. Ooh, I get an error. It says you cannot add or change a record because a related record is required in the table customer. Essentially, what it's telling us is there's no such thing as customer four. We've defined a foreign key. The customer ID in this table has to match up with one of the customer keys in the other table, uh, the primary key in the other table. And that's what a foreign key is, and that's what referential integrity is. So again, whether I'm using this program or any other program to access this database, I can't put in an order that doesn't have a corresponding customer to it. All right? Just can't do it. You know, I can take a sip. Try to sneak up on it, still won't do it, all right? I have to somehow correct it and put it in. What's more, I can't delete that because if I deleted that, it would leave that order out there that's pointing to this, it would leave it hanging, pointing to nothing. So the way that I have this foreign key set up it's not going to let me delete this. We'll talk about some of your options that you have later on. But this is referential integrity. In other words, there's no way in this database that we could have an order that doesn't have a valid customer. We can't add an order. We can't change an order to have a customer that doesn't exist. We can't delete a customer if it has orders associated with it. So we know the data is going to be good. Yes? I mean, it's paper resistant. Would okay. Uh, well... Uh, the, the question was, is what if, what if you got rid of a customer? What if you know, the customer died or if it was a business that went out of business and you want to get rid of it? Well, first of all, uh, some data you legally have to keep for a certain period of time regardless. So you know, even if they're, they're no longer a customer and, and, and they ordered, let's, be, you know, let's say they, they, the, you know, they moved out of town. That's, that's more optimistic than saying they died or whatever. All right? But let's say they're no longer a customer because they moved out of town. You still may have ordered, they still may have ordered something the first half of the year. So you would need to keep that for the records. So that's one thing, one reason. So you probably want to delete it. If anything, there, you might have a flag that says inactive and say, okay, this person's a customer, but they're not really active anymore. Now, periodically, after a certain period of time, then you might go and you might purge all their orders and then purge the customer. Now, one thing we'll look at later on is there is an option where when you delete a customer, for example, you could delete all the orders with it. Uh, we won't cover that example right now, but yeah, that's a good point. The way I have this one set up, it will restrict it. I think that's a good place to start. As, as the semester goes on, we'll look at some of the other options you have available too. All right? 
So, in a nutshell, these are the big things about relational databases. All right. Notice that we don't have any information about the customer in the order table other than to say what customer belongs to that order. It's okay to do that. It's okay to have the primary key in one table as the foreign key that points to who this belongs to. But we're not going to, for example, have the customer name or the customer phone number or whatever, because again, that's the old issue of redundancy that we discussed before. Any questions about any of this? Alrighty, we'll see you over in lab then.